themes and soundings in the Marian metaphysics of Father Peter Damien Fellner. And Jared just earned, we said that a little bit earlier, his doctorate from St. Louis University with an absolutely splendid book. I hope you'll bring that out so we can see it sometime in the afternoon, the Caritas. Okay, book. We can put it out. It does to thumb through it. Yeah, because uh, I, I, he let me study the earlier versions of it right before it got published, and uh, I honestly read it backwards and forwards about five times. So it's a <laughs> stupendous dissertation on Bonaventure's Mystery of the Trinity. Father Wayne and Father Peter were very much involved in, in that. It's all yours now, Jared. Well, yes, thank you for uh, being here. It's an honor. Um, and it's also wonderful to be presenting at this conference uh, in the presence of both my uh, dissertation director, Father Wayne, and uh, Father Peter, who I think actually ended up ghostwriting my, uh, my book and Weems, at least in terms of the arguments and themes. So, so it's a pleasure. Um, <clears throat> let me begin first. I think the schedule handout says something about a communique about the, uh, concerning the forthcoming first volume of Father Peter's uh, collected works. Well, um, yes, that is the case, and the first volume will be uh, a compilation of the essays, uh, totaling about 500 pages, five or six essays, um, on the theme of Marian metaphysics. And hopefully in my paper I'll begin to unpack just the, the foundational aspects of what motivates this approach and how this works. Um, <clears throat> but um, we're hoping that this will be published. Uh, we've, we have all the texts, we have the layout basically uh, ready, at least um, in an editable form. We hope to get this out though. I'm, I'm hoping for it, and this is subject to uh, the good friars in the back there uh, as well, and how, how, how good of condition I present the manuscript. But we're hoping to have it published sometime before the end of the, this year. So, and that will be the first volume of, we're saying 10 volumes, of collected works, but it could actually end up be, being more or less depending upon um, how we organize and divide the different topics. And uh, several people in this room are also helping out uh, in this project. Uh, Father Ed, uh, Father Angelo, um, Dr. Fastigi, I believe, um, and uh, you know, so, oh, Father Christian here. Uh, so uh, I think it's a good and worthy project and we're hoping to move pretty quickly through it once we get this first volume. Uh, collected. So, in this paper, I'm just going to pick out a couple of themes um, that Father Peter threads throughout his entire uh, approach to questions of Mariology in relation to metaphysics, but also how um, metaphysics relates to and is perfected in um, theology. And so, when Father Peter uh, was having memory difficulty with uh, summarizing a 200-page essay in this book, um, I'm going to stick pretty close to my text because I'm trying to uh, speak about a 500-page work. Um, uh, I have the advantage of having written this only, you know, finished it only several days ago, well, Father Peter, uh, five years ago, but, you know, I concede to his superior uh, memory on this, so I will stick to the text. So, let us dive in. <clears throat> this paper's uh, point of departure is the forthcoming first volume of Father Peter Damien Fellner's Collected Works a 500-page manum opus uh, that systematically expounds and applies the fruits of 50 years of prayerful reflection upon what Fellner terms uh, Marian metaphysics. Um, I will offer some reflections upon two axiomatic Fellnerian themes um, that are clearly interrelated, however. Uh, first, the, divine prim the primacy of divine charity, and second, the order of the hypostatic union. And obviously I can't be exhaustive here, and I'll have to uh, hit the mountain peaks and we can um, see the uh, move down into the valleys and see the linkages between the arguments in the larger work. So in this paper I hope uh, motivation um, will, uh, will be the result to look directly into Father Peter's work on uh, Marian metaphysics. And if you won't, wouldn't mind, could you pass me that water? <clears throat> this one right here. Thank you. Just in case. Um, <clears throat> and the paper will be divided into three basic parts. Um, the first part, then, uh, metaphysics and divine charity. Echoing St. Bonaventure, Fellner sums up his approach to metaphysics, stating, quote, Christ is our metaphysics, and its mode is Marian in the one economy of salvation. Elsewhere, he writes, metaphysics is rightly designated as exemplaristic, that is, the thought form which enables us not only to compare finite exemplatum with infinite exemplar, 
but eventually to recognize in the Son of Mary, the Son of God, the divine person not compared to, but on a par with the Father, Fontalis Plenitudo Bonitatis, whose incarnation is not only the prim primary basis for the possibility of creation, but for its eventual recapitulation and integration with the circle of divinity, namely, the unity of infinite and finite, divine being and human, in the substantial unity of one person without confusion of natures. With respect to the epistemic, critical question of metaphysical knowledge, Fellner writes, exemplarism, or typology, as exemplarism applied to scripture, is not only the starting point of all theological method, it also underlies all reasoning as rooted in the power to compare, assess, judge in, a, in terms of a standard. The univocal concept of being, as the translation of the metaphor of divine illumination into a more logical form, is but a neat way of summing up exemplarism at the level of reason, a foreshadowing of what will be the dogmatic formula at the heart of all biblical exemplarism or typology. Namely, one person in two natures, hypostatically united yet really distinct, adumbrated in the notion of being containing its intrinsic modes, the prima diversa, unconfused yet perfectly integrated in a certain order. Uh, end of quotation. Fellner's organization of metaphysics within a Christomarian exemplaristic exemplarist key, designated, designating, designating it as our metaphysics, pinpoints the distinctiveness of his Franciscan approach and outlook. Fellner sees metaphysics, although supposing logical possibility, scientific analysis, and categorization, as not ultimately based upon natural impersonal forces or causes, but upon an order between persons who by essence are rational agents. Fellner therefore articulates a vision of creation in the light of the priority of personal agency acting in terms of exemplarism <coughs> and recapitulation in a manner that situates the rationality and purpose of material creation within this order of persons, justifying and explaining in a sense uh, secondary causality on the part of physical forces on the supposition of the teleological priority of synergy between created will and divine will in the transformation of the imago dei into the similitudo dei. Fellner explains that the divine intention in creating, quote, includes not only a passive role for creation in its recapitulation, but also its cooperation in the accomplishment of this stupendous work, the recirculation of the original circulation from the creator, and secondly, the recirculation after the tragic misdirection represented by original sin. Thus, what St. Bonaventure calls the Marian mode of the incarnation is nothing but a technical term for the cooperation of the entire creation centered in, quoting Wordsworth here, our nature's, our tainted nature's solitary boast, the person of the immaculate or pre-redeemed. Here is the mystery, the apparent impossibility, nonetheless real, which must with Scotus be unraveled not merely at the empirical level of chronolo chronological succession or a series of accidentally, uh, or a series accidentally ordered, but at the metaphysical level of a series essentially ordered in the mind and heart of the Creator Savior, if we are to understand redemptive incarnation. That is, how the created in Mary can at once be redeemed yet, act, yet active participant in effecting the order of the hypostatic union and redemption. Close quote. For Fellner, then, the reasonability of the created order, exemplified most fully in human beings on the natural level as the mediatory imago dei, a composition of soul and body, explains the originating, exemplary, and final causal circle nested in the heart of the Father, whose infinite love flourishes in the eternal perichoretic love of the Trinity. A love, so Fellner, following Bonaventure and Scotus, that in the light of Revelation can be clearly understood to be the ground of the possibility that is the potuit of a created order. Infinite goodness and charity, as best characterizing the Deum Esse et Trinum, in its being and relations of origin, then, is the basis of the ordered love of God as manifested in the actual economy of redemption and salvation. That is, the fatuit flowing from and based upon, the fatuit, excuse me, flowing from and based upon the decuit. On this point, Fellner writes, quote, the antecedent unity of power of the three divine persons in creating has its premise in the dual processions of Son from Father and Spirit from Father through Son, a duality reflected in creation, close quote. 
Fellner, in understanding God's infinite power as actual in the productions of the Son and Spirit, and thus the primacy of divine circumcision, implies two foundational truths about God and His activity. First, perfect being is rational by nature and therefore personal, originating from the person of the Father, and in actu primu, primo, acts as a second person. Second, in perfect, that is infinite being, personal being is necessarily tripersonal and free, accenting the complement of divine knowledge appropriated to the Son in the spiration of the Spirit through the Son, the middle and mediating person, so Bonaventure, which affects a return to the Father. This infinite flourishing in the Trinity is personal and free, rooted and fulfilled in charity, the loving acceptance of the infinite good for its own sake. Fellner, again following Bonaventure and Scotus, explains that this charity originates in and from the Father in a natural mode of activity that terminates in the Son, or the Word, and is simultaneously perfected in the voluntary, voluntary mode of activity in the spiration of the Spirit as the gift or bond of charity. Although I can't here give an adequate uh, even summary of Fellner's Bonavent Bonaventurian account of the mystery of the Trinity, the central point to note here is that charity holds a certain primacy and the voluntary mode of action is most perfectly personal because free and as personal, rational. So thus it's linking freedom and spontaneity with rationality and thus personal action and personhood. Flowing out of the above consideration, um, Fellner contends that any, quote, pure metaphysics, Greek or German, that systematically or merely de facto fails to consider the priority of divine charity as not only incomplete, but false in implication and application. According to Fellner, metaphysics, like philosophy in general, is in the, in the final analysis a consideration of an order of persons in charity. When the economy of salvation is seen in terms of the priority of divine charity extended to creation, metaphysics becomes then, for Fellner, fundamentally dogmatic theology as revealed in faith in the Trinity and the economy of salvation rooted in the fittingness and priority of the order of the hypostatic union, that is, the incarnation and the divine maternity. According to Fellner, the purpose of the created person bearing upon the relation and resolution of nature to supernature in general, and knowledge and judgment specifically, is bound up in how one understands the place of Mary as Panagia Theotokos in the eternal counsels of God and as realized in history. For Fellner, resolution of the purpose of human rationality then includes the perfect created personhood of Mary as both the condition of the Word's assumption of our humanity as well as the realization of the incarnate Word's perfect work of redemption and salvation. As Fellner puts it, quote, the issue of created rationality as perfected in Mary concerns the relation or the relations between philosophy and theology and reason and faith, close quote. How one understands Mary relates directly to any answer offered to the question, again quoting Fellner here, what difference does the light of faith working through charity make in the use of reason, in fieri, and its outcome, that is, knowledge in facto esse, of being. The iconic and mediating nature of the imago dei, uniting both matter and spirit, perfectly personified in the hypostatic union and perfectly personalized in Mary, then serves for Fellner as the presupposition for understanding the purpose and end of creation as willed by God. Mary as a, as a created perfection, or as, a, as rather, or more clearly, a perfect creature, um, <clears throat> also locates the concrete realization and actualization of God's purpose in history as its fulfillment and also supernatural eschatological call for all humanity in that Marian context, in the context of the mystical body. Thus, creation's meaning is bound up with anthropology understood metaphysically in terms of the signs of the divine will, that is, the eternal counsels of God, um, spoken of as being nested in the heart of the Father. So, anthropology understood in terms of the signs of the divine will and its created rational complement and fulfillment in the persons of the incarnate Word and His Mother. Mary, as all-holy, virgin mother of God, posits a unique relation or relationship to the incarnate word. She is the perfect term or concrete archetype of creation who by virtue of her purity of sin and fullness of grace manifests 
creaturely perfection as a mirror of Christ as he mirrors and mediates divine perfection. In her created perfection, Mary receives the fullness of the Spirit from the beginning of her existence on account of her unique relation to Christ, allowing her to bring forth Christ from her own substance as well as within her heart or soul. Mary as mother and perfect disciple of Jesus, uniquely, that is with perfect freedom because all holy, can cooperate then in every aspect of Christ's life and ministry in the Spirit. Mary then also becomes the exemplar of the typological, anti-typological pattern of biblical revelation, as well as in her personal agency, insofar as she brings to bear a personal influence upon all whom God loves and would have Christ also formed in them, uh, quoting uh, St. Paul in Galatians chapter 4. <clears throat> Fellner notes that, quote, in the present order of creation, actually willed by the Creator in view of the incarnation and redemption, that is the absolute primacy of Christ, each, points, each of the points concerning Christian philosophy and metaphysics reveals a profoundly Marian mode, close quote. The Franciscan school of theology and spirituality reasons first from the single real order of creation as revealed in Christ, which in turn encompasses every aspect of life and reality, including uh, for the topic of metaphysics, especially the purpose of creation as such in its natural potencies or, or capacities. This indicates that while speculation about possibles and counterfactuals clearly has a place on the one hand and that theology and philosophy and the other humane and uh, scientific pursuits have an integrity and distinctness of their own on the other, the economy of salvation founded upon the absolute primacy of Christ in a, in a Marian mode reveals the reason and reasonability of creation. For Fellner then, this primacy of the hypostatic order is mediatory both ontologically and epistemologically in revealing the priority of charity in the Godhead rooted in the originative plenitude of the Father ad intra, as well as the primacy of divine charity manifest ad extra in the fitting order, the decuit rather than the potuit, deriving from the free act of loving and willing creation in and for the sake of Jesus and Mary. Thus, for Fellner, the absolute primacy of Jesus and Mary implies both a metaphysical theology as well as a theological metaphysics revealing and articulating the good pleasure of God as well as the modes of activity and purpose of creation as such. Part two, the image or the image of God for the sake of the likeness of God and Mary as perfect likeness of God. Fellner's development of Franciscan theological anthropology in the light of his position on the interrelation and interaction between God and human persons is extensive, uh, nuanced, and complex, and I can't uh, really fully explain or expound that. Um, so here I just will touch upon a few points. Above, I discussed how metaphysics and theology neither derive from nor ultimately concern notions of essence, idea, or end considered an abstraction apart from Christ and Mary. For Fellner, then, metaphysics pertains to concrete reality rooted in the charity of the Father, the Trinity ad extra and the whole Christ in a Marian mode, the Trinity ad intra, excuse me, and the whole Christ in a Marian mode ad extra. This insight, when systematically applied to theology and metaphysics, carries profound implications for many topics, and here I will just mention a few. Uh, the first that one could mention is the relation and resolution between intellect and will. A second is natural and voluntary powers and manners of activity, how those relate. Uh, the third is human beings as created in the image and likeness of the Trinity. What does that mean? Um, the fourth is the relation and order between nature and supernature, especially as it pertains to the natural desire for God and the final cause of created rational agents. And then the fifth point or area that I will mention here is <clears throat> this, this mode of approaching these problems also pertains to the resolution and retracing of created reason and natural faith into supernatural faith and charity. <clears throat> Each topic uh, just mentioned is deeply affected then by how one understands the primacy of Jesus and Mary. If charity, personal action, and thus persons structure creation, then what God actually prefers and actually accomplish should never and cannot arguably reasonably be excluded from th both theological or from either theological or philosophical discourse, however much distinction must remain. For Fellner, the pivotal fact, which is a, which is a mystery itself, is human nature 
as the divinely illumined image of God, perfectly realized in the person of Mary. Fel, um, Mary, from the first moment of her existence, is filled with every virtue and perfection, making her qualitatively. And this touches upon uh, formal identity, yet um, in terms of quiddity or, or structure. The, those perfectiones simpliciter, uh, simplices, um, that can be realized or manifest in a finite mode or an infinite mode and properly find their full realization in an infinite mode, but yet when they're found in a finite mode, they also bear the same quality and are potentially infinite intrinsically, even if not able to be activated in terms of their own active capacities. But if God acts to hierarchize or raise up the mode of act activity, then they're open to that mode of activity as well. <clears throat> so... So, this, so uh, that's an important qualification because when I say here, um, Mary from the first moment of her existence is filled with every virtue and perfection, making her qualitatively. I'm referring to that um, univocal note that can be realized uh, disjunctively according to finite and infinite, making her qualitatively in the perfection of her man humanity identical to the man God, Jesus, and his perfect humanity. In this, Mary reveals the full potential of human persons and thus by implication, human created rationality, to freely correspond to and synergistically act with the spirit to shape and govern the created order in its recapitulation in Christ and return to the Father. It is in Mary then that we find the only real purpose of being a created, rational, personal creature as such because we don't attribute creaturehood to the Son even though he has a created nature, he's not called a creature because he's a divine person. So in Mary, we then find the, the, the clear, concrete, real term of a created person or a personal creature. So moving then to the third part of this um, paper then. <clears throat> uh, part three, analogy of emphasis and manifestation in the soul as image and similitude of God. Uh, the pairs I noted in the previous section, that is um, nature, supernature, intellect, will, reason, faith, uh, those pairs are not in relation then, in relations of exclusion, considered according to a kind of calculus of, of contraries, um, in the primary sense, rather for Fellner, in Mary's perfect humanity, each is ordered yet inexistent, and the relation then is a question of emphasis, mode, and degree, implying a certain front-loading of the final purpose um, into the beginning, realized, however, not in an, encl in, in, an enclosed and imperative monergism, but in spontaneous and, and perfectly free synergy between creator and creature. For Fellner, then, it seems to me, questions of nature, supernature, reason, faith, and the like, in light of the signs of the divine will, cannot be, in theory or in fact, separated. Any analysis of these seeming contrary disjuncts must be approached according to what, what, what one can term an analogy of emphasis. Um, with the prior understanding that in Mary, nature and person, though distinct, cannot be separated, and the concrete divine purpose of the created image in Mary is to be a perfect likeness of God. <clears throat> in the economy of salvation in Christ, then, for each pair, the foundation, that is nature, um, is, or, or, or the like, is for its complement in terms of um, the signs of the divine will, and the complement requires its foundation for it to act upon and raise up. Moreover, again, at issue for Fellner, then, is a question, question of mode of activity and degree of activation rather than an aggregation of accidental powers or habits. In each of these pairs I mention, and others could be added, there is a participation or a concursus first, which is dynamically oriented towards its complement and is realized in specifically different modes, not according to objects or, or agents, um, as an interrelation and interaction between personal agents in a specific mode of concursus. <clears throat> Thus, as image of God, the soul and its intellectual power is always ordered toward voluntary act as well as disposed toward similitude. Um, and a basic distinction then uh, that I should probably raise at this point is the distinction between image and similitude in St. Bonaventure refers to the natural powers, emphasizing mainly intellection, although volition is always included, and similitude is those natural powers informed by charity. 
So nature, grace. Image similitude, nature, grace is the basic uh, way to understand that distinction. So what I'm saying here is image is always for the sake of and finds its purpose in similitude. And similitude is always an objective capacity of being an image be in virtue of what Father Peter mentioned, these, these simply simple perfections or, or even in St. Bonaventure, divine illumination. That, 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 that aspect of the created rational agent or person that distinguishes a person, distinguishes it as a person qua person from um, a brute or a subpersonal being. Um, <clears throat> moreover, then, a uh, voluntary act is never devoid of knowledge, and natural knowledge is perfected in and through the grace of charity. Formally identical for Fellner and the Scotistic uh, Bonaventurian tradition, arguably, in pilgrimage and in heaven. The charity is formally identical. It's the same reality, uh, though differing in degree and thus intensity and stability. In Fellner's account, then, the image can have certainty about God's infinite perfection on the basis of a kind of natural faith rooted in the illuminating concept of being, a concept in its, in its purity that distinguishes the power of the image from the vestige, the rational being from the brute. When being is seen to transcend categorization and in itself admit of no circumscription, a knowledge of pure or infinite being is possible. In knowledge of creation, being and thus infinite being is always, whether acknowledged or not, present to the soul and thus calling the person to take a stance with respect to this source of truth and goodness. For Fellner, knowledge itself then is a call to the person to humble adoration of infinite truth, beauty, and goodness, which the person through the powers of judgment and choice can accept or reject that call to humble adoration. However, knowledge of infinite being in this mode is only ever indirect and inferential, proceeding from finite effect to infinite cause. Although the will is bound up in such knowledge, again because the whole person is acting in and through each of its powers, the accent is upon intellect, that is on the status of the created person as image, um, <clears throat> in objectifying being through an inner word or concept. Such natural knowledge rooted in a kind of natural faith in the light of reason cannot fully satisfy or realize the purpose of created rationality, which is to directly love infinite goodness in its truth and beauty in a manner characterized by perfect peace and rest, as opposed to instability and incompleteness. This is because perfect charity is not yet activated. Faith is needed to provide clear knowledge of God's salvific purpose and charity for direct contact with the object of our faith and love. If human persons, considered under the aspect of knowledge and the image emphasizes intellect without separating such activity from will, the life of charity and faith extends the will without severing, severing it from knowledge. As charity perfects voluntary action, so love perfects knowledge as it forms faith, contemplation, and ultimately vision face to face. On this account of theological anthropology, clarified in the person of Mary, sin, takes, sin then takes on its proper character as a virtually unintelligible mystery. However, from the vantage point of the finitude of the image and the formal distinction between the soul's powers, it becomes possible to describe the possibility of a kind of short-circuiting of the resolution of intellect into affection, that is, knowledge into charity, as they both commonly flow from memory. For Fellner, it is the irrational incomplete resolution of the divine light of being to its source that lies at the heart of the so-called critical question, uh, sin and uh, a kind of will to autonomy. As finite, it is, it is perhaps possible that a human person not achieve perfect similitude to God, God's creative freedom, nor is created freedom uh, n in no way forced. Neither, neither is forced. However, as essentially, potentially infinite in its rational power, that is, in the image's rational power to become a similitude, the perfection of God's work in working in, with, and through creation in the persons of Jesus and Mary declares with ringing clarity that God wills and, in ha and has, in fact, accomplished what is most fitting and loving. God calls all created images of God, that is, created persons, to find their true selves, their eternal well-being, in likeness to Christ through Mary and ultimately um, in a return to the Father. I shall uh, close my paper then with uh, Fellner's own words. Quote, 
the absolute primacy of Christ, reduced to its radical practical implication, implications no longer familiar to most, was taken for granted by the great Franciscan scholars of the past. Hence the difficulty at present of appreciating the Marian character of all genuine philosophy or love of wisdom, the subconscious inclination to think it odd to call Mary the philosophy of Christians, and the refusal by so many to accept that Christian metaphysics is not primarily about efficient and final causality, but literally is Christ. It is a metaphysics of exemplarism and divine illumination. Precisely because the Virgin Mary pertains to the order of the hypostatic union, and so is uniquely associated with the theandric actions of her Son and Savior, she is uniquely the teacher of the apostles and the faithful. Thank you. We've got a couple of minutes. I wonder if Father Peter wants to uh, uh, respond to what Jared's presented here. It's, just a, it's a good recapitulation of the primary points I was making in the discussion of Marian uh, meta meta metaphysics is to point out that all metaphysics, even though natural metaphysics that we can, without uh, without the grace of faith, uh, about, all have a personal dimension in the final an an analysis. And the, the presence of that of, uh, uh, the metaphysical dimension of our, our our intellects is the reason why we cannot reduce knowledge simply to scientific scientific uh, uh, knowledge. Uh, discussion of this by Bonaventure is to be found in these last last words of collations on the hexameron, the one that was the object of a co complete study of a Pope, uh, Pope Benedict XVI. Only the part about the, the theology of history got pu published, but that is part of a larger discussion, involves questions of epistemology. I don't know, I haven't read the entire German of that part, but, but uh, fully, uh, fully underscored, as it were, the, the personal dimension is identical with the thoughts in many places of, of, of Newman. Uh, Newman. But in particular, the first collation, okay, practically all of the chief points are present in one, one or no, no, another, another way. Our metaphysics is personal and it is Christ like ours. There is no metaphysics. We get beyond the physical precisely because we are able to get, be, uh, get to the per personal. Not only as scholars will add, uh, 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 um, modifying the terminology a, a little bit of what Bonaventure means by divine illumination, that Christ is the light of, light of the world. Then one way or another, even before he comes into the world, by way of the incarnation, there are signs as were that indicate something more is, poss uh, is possible. Is, is it possible actually to realize this something, something more? And for Bonaventure, the answer is simply yes, because Christ has come into the world and he has remained with us for all, all times, and that the study of metaphysics in a particular way begins to bring out what is fundamental to the, the, the major proof for God's existence. It's uh, exempl 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 exemplaristic. Not simply as it were from from this exists, therefore God exists, but the point that we already know that He exists, but in a confused way, and the the major proofs for God, such as that of, of Scotus, intend not so much as it were to discover another fact that we didn't know about, but to distinguish clearly between that which is infinite, that which is divine-like, and that which is cre uh, created, and then as it were have a basis for understanding as it were the possibility of elevation to what is called the supernatural order. Anyway, there's a great deal <laughs> summed up there. You have to go back and get hold, get hold of those 500 pages. <laughs> <laughs> so, so hopefully that wasn't too of an off-putting. But almost every, every point that he's making here is found literally in some place in St. Bonaventure and to a certain extent uh, polished up a little bit by Dun Scotus. Well, thank you. That brings us right to the noon hour and uh, it enables us to take a very short walk to the old Bon Pain in the library, the Hesburg Library, for a sandwich or soup. A lovely spot to get something to eat for half an hour. Or you can go on the other side of this uh, huge, uh, what I call the stone bench and the water flowing, the, the memorial to the wars. But the, the student uh, food porch is right there. There's an upstairs and a downstairs. So mm. uh, uh, then we'll be back here at 1 o'clock to uh, listen to Monsignor 
Calkins as he speaks to us on Father Peter Damien Fellner and the Magisterium. Okay, so bon appetit, everyone. <laughs>